Welcome to this short journey with mob programming, or I should probably say software teaming, because both in Norwegian and English there's a push to move away from the term mob, because it has some negative associations with it. So <laughs> so, but, it but it sounds fun in Norwegian when you say, let's go mob. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to try to stick with software teaming throughout this talk, but I may use them interchangeably, because we called it mob programming when we worked with it in my team. I'm Helene Persson. Uh, I use the pronouns she, her, they, them. And I have a master's degree in high energy particle physics, which is just a fancy way of saying that I did data analysis trying to solve the universe mysteries. No biggie, no biggie. Uh, and it wasn't until I started university that I learned that I liked programming. And um, I remember sitting in my first programming lecture in my first year, and the professor asked, how many of you have programmed before? We were 300 students in that class, and about half of them raised their arms. And I was going to myself, OK, I'm going to fail. <laughs> That's a great way to start university. But it didn't happen. I passed, and I found out that I actually like programming. I enjoy working with it. So I chose as much as I could into my degree. And when I finished university and I was thinking about what do I want to do for work, I knew that I wanted to do something with programming. Uh, and I thought I was going into data science. But an opportunity turned out to be a front-end developer. And I took it and I love it. And being a developer is kind of like being a physicist, actually, because I get to solve problems with programming. It's the same thing I did in university. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm a front-end developer at NRK, where I work on internal systems for uh, archiving and publishing radio shows and podcasts. And imagine this scenario. You're in a meeting and you're discussing shapes, because shapes are very important for your client or your users. But you don't go into details. You just say shapes. It's a good word. It covers everything. Your team may be left with different ideas of what a shape is or what they're supposed to build. And when they leave this meeting, if they have these uh, conflicting ideas, <coughs> it may result in some part of your team having to rewrite their code, do double work, because you didn't talk it through. Software teaming is a, a possible tool that can help alleviate this. And why were we, uh, why were we doing software teaming? Well, uh, we have this system uh, that is a special program that only lives on special computers. PCs, no Macs, only PCs. And you have to use that to get your audio for your podcast into our system. OK, so if you edit your uh, podcast on a Mac or a non-special PC, you have to transfer that audio file into a special PC use that system to get it into our system so it can go out to the audience. Sounds kind of tedious. We need something new. So we were tasked with uh, changing this and make a new entry system for audio on podcasts. And it involves our entire tech stack, both front end and uh, back end. So it's a perfect opportunity to try out software teaming. Uh, and the idea in software teaming is that for an idea to go from your head to the computer, it has to go through someone else's hands. And before I move on further, I want to just ask quickly, how many here have heard about mob programming or software teaming before? OK, a couple of you, good. How many of you have actually tried it and used it yourself? Ah, still a good group. That's great. So the next part, you can relax now. It's going to be a little bit of repetition for you guys, but just so the entire room agrees on what we are talking about, I'm going to run through quickly how software teaming might work in practice. So there were some cute cats earlier today. I don't have my own cats, so I had to uh, make some. Um, <laughs> but I su fully support uh, cats on slides. And in software teaming, you work together. Everybody that's needed is in the room, and you sit around looking at one screen uh, and share one keyboard. And the group member that's currently holding the keyboard is the pilot or the driver. And the rest of the group are called the navigators. 
And the pilot's job is to type in what's being said and proposed from the group of navigators. And the navigator's job is like being a map reader. You have to tell the pilot where to go, what to write, and how to write it. And these roles, they uh, rotate in the group. So everybody participates in every role. And you have kind of quick changes, maybe down to a couple minutes of being pilot, and then you change again, or longer periods of time. Depends on what your group thinks is most efficient for them. And I like lists, but there's only two lists in this slide. Here's the first one. And uh, software teaming 101. OK. We know pilot navigator. That's mostly what you have to remember. But everybody participates all the time. This doesn't mean you have to have an opinion about everything or you have to be mentally present all the time. It's OK to zone out. Uh, it's okay to zone out now as well, if you heard this talk before. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you when you have to come back. Uh, but the main part is that everybody's there when they're needed. And this one is really hard, but it's something you have to practice um, and figure out how to do. And it's say the right thing at the right time, the right way. Because when you're working in a group, it can be kind of intense. <laughs> and you're trying to have focus on maybe line 15 where you're working, and then one in the group sees an error on line 30. And it's really tempting to go out and be like, hey, we're missing a colon on line 30. And then you shift the entire focus of the entire group and maybe breaks the flow that they're in, and then you have to go back, but wait, what were we actually doing? So to f figure out how to say what you need to say when you need to say it, is a task that everybody needs practice on. Work together, and with this I mean create issues, solve issues, discuss, create ideas together, as long as it's feasible. It's okay to break away, maybe have some alone time with gathering ideas, and then you come back to the group, and then you can pick the best from everyone. Oh, I like this part from this idea, and I like this part from this idea. So uh, having time apart is okay, but most of the work should be done together, and decisions should be made together. Create good habits. It's like uh, shouldn't have to tell that to, to people, but uh, it's still very important, so it's on my slides, because it's hard to get into a good rhythm. It's hard to find good habits. And sometimes when you work closely with people, they annoy you. So you just have to figure out a way to deal with that that doesn't break up the group. And now we have enough to embark on our journey together, but also my team's journey with software teaming. So we started out six people. N none of us had ever done software teaming, but how hard can it be? We understand the concept. We know what it is. We've heard about it. Well, you don't. Uh, you don't really know what software teaming is until you tried it. And we spent a couple of weeks like feeling like we didn't get the hang of it. It was really hard, so we had to call in some uh, experts, and we're lucky to have that at NRK, some software teaming experts. So they came in and helped us a lot, gave us some tips and tricks. And I'm going to share some of them with you during this talk. So when you go out and try software teaming yourself, maybe you can avoid some of the blunders that we did. In a group, uh, it's always going to be discussions or conflicts. And it's tempting to just say that the best way to resolve them is uh, the golden middle way or the golden mean. But is that actually the best way um, all the time? Let's say that uh, your group is discussion, discussing how long uh, a piloting session should be. Like, how long are you the pilot? Someone maybe wants five minutes. Another in your group wants 10 minutes. OK, we just split it. Let's go in the middle with seven and a half. And now you may end up in a situation that actually doesn't work for anybody, doesn't feel good for anybody. Because what it turns out you needed was 10 minutes in the morning when everybody was feeling rested and had their morning coffee and was happy. And then in the afternoon, you could switch to having five minute sessions because you needed the quick change to keep everybody engaged and on track. And finding the flow in a group is hard. We were a group of six. That's 
maybe a little bit too many to do software teaming, if I were to be honest. I would say like four and five is uh, optimal. Six works, it's just more people that have needs <laughs> you need to figure out. Um, but uh, one of our biggest problems was uh, tasks outside the project, because we didn't do this full time when we started. And when you've been doing software teaming for six hours and you come out from that meeting room and you're kind of deflated, <laughs> It's hard to pick up another task and do that for the rest of your day. So we solved this by moving our focus almost 100% to this current uh, software teaming task and letting non-critical tasks just wait. We were doing this for a month. It can wait. It's okay. <laughs> and we also learned that if needed, some people can break away from the software teaming group and solve critical issues. It's not a problem. And we lost a lot of time and flow and momentum in changing pilots because we were only doing this for a month. So we thought it's easier for all of us if we just use our own laptops so we don't have to find a keyboard and an editor setup that everybody agrees on. And, and that sounds OK. Like, it's a short amount of time. It's, it's efficient, right? And Git is your friend. You can just push and pull whenever you need to. Well. It's maybe not that efficient because every time you're switching pilot, you have to make a commit. <laughs> Work in progress, part 344, still not working. <laughs> but every problem has a solution. And we started using MobSH, which is a cute little program that lives in your terminal keeps track of your uh, uh, Git branches and with three easy commits, uh, commands, sorry. It helps you to just push and pull the code you need. It creates temporary Git branches for you. And when you're done, you just do mob done and you get one clean commit for all the work that's done that session. And breaks. Breaks are good, but they are also bad. Uh, and if I were to do software teaming again, I would opt for more individual breaks where you can leave the room when you need to instead of having breaks after a set amount of time. Because if you're in a flow, it's really disruptive. When it's like ding, 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 timer went off, 15 minutes break. Oh, we just got started. OK, everybody leave, everybody out. <laughs> and then you have to start finding that flow again. Uh, and that's hard. And uh, what is happening? Because we were front-end and back-end together. We were doing back-end things in Java, front-end things in JavaScript, which meant that at any point of time, some of us was working in a language that they don't use or don't understand or don't know. So we were spending a lot of time really trying to make sure everybody understood everything we were doing. That sounds like the ideal, nice place you want to be. But it's a time hole, sinks you down, you get nothing done. <laughs> and the goal of this wasn't to make all of us turn into full stack developers when we were finished. So we had to learn the hard way. It's OK to not understand everything at every point of time, as long as you understand the main ideas and why you're doing what you're doing. It's OK for me to not understand Java in the back end. And time is of the essence. You never have enough time. And software teaming actually uh, gives you back some time that we often lose as developers. Being, uh, we don't have to do pull requests because everybody's there. Everybody's watching the code happen at the same time. So you don't have to do uh, pull requests, which means you don't have to spend time reviewing them and you don't have to spend time waiting for your work to be reviewed. But there's also a downside, and that's the small, simple tasks that you think, oh, this will take me five minutes to fix on my own. It feels like it takes forever doing that in software teaming, because first you have to have your ID, then you have to explain it to someone else, and then they have to type it in. It takes much longer than just doing it yourself. But the good thing here is that when doing it in software teaming, someone may be able to say, hey, Good idea. How about this edge case? Oh, you haven't thought about that. OK, let's fix it now instead of waiting for a bug in production and then having to 
<laughs> throw everything up in the air and fix it immediately. So there's good and bad with everything. And our biggest benefit uh, from this is shared knowledge uh, across our entire team. Because when you work together, you also share experiences together and you get a better understanding of the pain points that front end and back end faces and what they have to endure and how our systems communicate and work together. And I'm not going off on a long tangent here now, but I just have to share a story from when I started working in this team. Um, the back end was working on splitting a text field uh, into two. Sounds like a pretty simple task. Just split the text field. Uh, it wasn't, and it's not that I didn't believe my coworkers, like I thought they were doing their best, but I couldn't wrap my head around why is this taking months and months to split this text field. Well, now I know. I've seen the complexity of their system with my own eyes. I've felt the frustration of being pulled to almost a slow motion of technical depth and old good ideas. Uh, so now <laughs> I understand much more what they're doing. And I also think that even if we're not doing software teaming every day now, uh, it made us a better team in the fa fact that we now know how to describe our needs better when we are in meetings and discussing together, and we find better solutions because we have an under a common understanding. Uh, and a question that at least popped into my mind as a junior is how is it going to be being a junior and a senior together in a, a software teaming group? <laughs> and actually, it works out pretty nice. It's quite easy. Um, and I would approach this question the same way as we had to approach the question of people knowing different programming languages. If you're working with something, uh, and let's say the pilot knows how to write a function in that language, the navigators can easily say, OK, we need a function now, and the pilot knows how to do that. But if the pilot doesn't know, the navigators can simply change the language into being, OK, we need a function now. To write a function, you do this, or you type in this. And that's a great uh, learning experience. And a little like note or caveat or whatever you want to call it is, please let your juniors be active in the discussion. Let them have ideas. Don't shoot them down too early. And maybe try out their idea first, and then you can build with the seniors' experience on top of that, or show, OK, we tried this. Turns out it didn't work, but it was a great possibility, it might have worked, because sometimes, uh, and I said I was a junior, so it's a little bit of like a clap on the back to, uh, to us, but sometimes we have good ideas. <laughs> sometimes we're not stuck in the way things have always been. So listen to your juniors, uh, but also guide them. It's okay to tell them, this, this doesn't work, or this doesn't work because this and this. And also, I must say, like a like last point on this slide, uh, sometimes new stuff happens in programming, uh, and there's new ways to do things. So something that didn't work five, six years ago, oh, uh, may work now. And <laughs> they might have learned that in school. So <laughs> really, listen to your juniors. That's my, that's my point. Uh, and we're going in reaching the final uh, step, uh, and that's planning. And I know that a lot of people, when they talk about software teaming, they don't talk about planning, but it was such a huge issue for us. How do we keep track of everything that needs to be done, big and small? How do we take all those things that just pop into your mind while you're working and keep them in one place so everybody knows that you thought about this on Monday when you're not here on Wednesday? How do we keep track of the things that we're not doing? Because when you're working on something, there's going to be something that you think, oh, this is really cool, I want to do this. But it's kind of out of scope. <laughs> 
uh, maybe if we have time after delivery, we can do that. Well, our solution was pretty simple. Uh, this is a Lucid Spark board with post-it notes. And this worked wonders for us. It helped us give a place, so each post-it note is a little thing. And most of them, because we like to turn them green when we're done, are small, small, small things that we can do within that session. We try to split everything up to that. And then we can just move them around. OK, we didn't finish this, this session. OK, let's pull it and take it with us to the next. Or we kind of finished this. It's working, but it's not perfect. OK, let's write a note that it could be an improvement uh, and put it in the um, improvement slot box. And let's move on. And uh, as I said in the beginning on this slide, I know that people don't talk about it that much. And I know that people that work full time with software teaming doesn't necessarily plan out things to this degree. But for us, it was a super useful tool. And we had a very limited time frame that we were working on. Uh, so it was good to actually be able to say, this is off limits, this is out of scope, or this is something that the front end or the back end could fix on their own after we have delivered this work. And whenever I'm listening to talks like this, I'm always sitting there, oh, but how did it go with the project? You tell me all this stuff, but you don't talk about what happened. <laughs> and I have to admit, we spent two months. We were only supposed to spend one. Uh, and the first part, part, which we thought was going to be the easiest, took the longest. And most of this is because we didn't allow for time in our planning to learn software teaming. We just started off, thought, we'll get it down within an hour. <laughs> we didn't. We had a lot of retros discussions about how we want to work together, changing, thing up, uh, changing things up, uh, trying this thing one week, trying this thing another week, finding out nothing really works for us, so trying a, uh, trying a third thing the next week. And that's OK. So if you're sitting here thinking, I want to try software teaming, but I'm not sure how to approach it, it's really easy to start. Uh, it's been said many times today, just do it. I like Igvene, we work together at the <laughs> NRK. <laughs> uh, that's going to be my new motto, just do it. Uh, but also, give yourself some grace. Allow you for some time to learn. And then the product. It turned out awesome. <laughs> so great. And now you actually can upload audio to your podcast from any computer, which is like amazing. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I think this product turns out better than what it would have done if we hadn't done software teaming. And the final takeaways. This is the second list I talked about. It's fun to try something new. It was really fun to try a new way of working, and we learned so much as a team just doing it for two months. And with software teaming, you get a common understanding of your code base, which means that you're not depending on that one person in your team that knows that one system, that knows how that integrated with that other one system. So it's a great way to spre spread knowledge around. And software teaming can be a great tool. But like all tools, it's good and bad. It's good because there are many people looking at the same problem, creating the best ideas. But I don't want to also just sugarcoat it for you guys. So I'm going to be honest and say that it also can be quite demanding to be in a software teaming group. And it doesn't work for everybody. So I think that being part of a software teaming group should be voluntary, should be an option, should be something you do because you think it's fun. Um, and just know you're going to learn your coworkers to know a little bit uh, more than you just do in <laughs> sitting <laughs> in the office every day. And have time to plan for learning in the beginning. And with my last point is that rules are meant to be broken. I've shared my story and or our story here today. Take away what you like. And there's really not one way to do anything, especially not software teaming. So in any group, you have to discuss how you like it. 
even if it's the first time you're doing it or you've done it a hundred times and you're creating a new group, you have to take time to do the retros to talk about how you guys want to work together. And if it's not clear where I land on this question today, what do I think about software teaming? I think that if you're thinking about it, you should definitely try it. And if you want to discuss software teaming, programming, maybe particle physics, you can follow this link and find me on LinkedIn. Thank you for your time. Thank you.